Thank you very much. This talk is about a revolution. Don't worry. No one died in this revolution, and not a single shot was fired. And yet, it is changing the lives of millions of people all over the world. So what's this revolution about? Simply put, the ways in which students learn about the world is increasingly facilitated by technology. This educational revolution is creating new opportunities for accessing knowledge that have never before existed. But perhaps most striking isn't the opportunity this revolution is bringing with it, but rather what it is making redundant. Can anyone recognize the stacks of the Ben-Gurion Main Library? I'm guessing not many of you. The library was closed last year for a period of a few months for asbestos removal, and it's safe to say that many of the Ben-Gurion community, myself included, didn't feel this loss, simply because we don't have a reason to venture into the library right now. Everything is at our fingertips. So I know what you're thinking. What's the big deal about? Digital media has changed the way movies are stored, music is stored, and now it's changing how educational content is stored. Ah, but there is a big difference. We are at a pivotal moment where two factors have combined. The availability of data that originates from students' use of educational software and our ability to understand and make sense of this data using sophisticated algorithms. And together, these combinations are going to bring about a paradigm shift in the way students learn. And let me give you a few examples of how this paradigm shift is going to come about. When I was an undergraduate, I loved working in groups. And I always sought to find the optimal group size. It was, for me, n equals 3. I always chose a student that was noticeably stronger than me, so I could ask all the stuff I didn't understand in class, and believe me, there was a lot. And I also sought a student who was weaker than myself, so I could feel good about myself for helping someone. But tomorrow's courses are going to employ algorithms that will automatically find the best set of students for me to study with, and they'll be looking at my history of performance in the course, and they're going to find the best students to pair up and to maximize my learning with the group. And moreover, they won't be confined to the brick-and-mortar course that I'll be taking. They will be able to access students in other courses worldwide that are taking this course online, perhaps. And even more than that, they're going to monitor how the group evolves in its learning. They're going to identify critical moments in the group's interaction. For example, identifying that someone has ignored an important argument, or maybe the group is stagnating. And they'll be able to present this information visually to a teacher, to help the teacher monitor the state of each and every group, so the teacher will have a kind of a heat map, and the teacher could decide to intervene when deemed necessary. So that's one example of how the paradigm shift will come about. Here's another. When I was in high school in Tel Aviv, I dropped out of my last A-level unit in physics. I was just so frustrated with the lab. There was very few equipment that actually worked, a big queue of 40 students to try to use the equipment, and a single teacher, overworked, underpaid, in no way capable of providing support for all of the students who needed that person's help in the lab. Well, today, labs have become virtual environments, that provide us with real simulations of physical processes. And this provides students with open-ended and flexible software that allows them to build models of the world, run the model, and analyze the data. And just so you understand, this physics environment is so real that if I leave this flask uncovered, wa the water is going to evaporate. So, these exploratory learning environments provide a rich educational world for the students, and they support activities that facilitate their learning, like exploration, trial and error, and interleaving of activities. These are very important activities. They're what support lab studies. So I've given you two examples of, of this paradigm shift. How can it come about? I claim that in order for a real change to occur in learning, 
We have to design computer systems that are true collaborators and partners to the learning experience. We can't make computers replace teachers. We can't make computers disrupt the learning process of students. Rather, the computers should be collaborators. This means that from the student perspective, they provide intelligent, machine-generated support that understands the individual needs of each student, that seamlessly guide the student in its learning process and intervene only when needed. From the teacher's perspective, this means that the computers should provide intelligent visualizations of how students use software, providing the teachers with the ability to monitor what the students are doing and to intervene if deemed necessary. Let me give you two examples of my work in Ben Gurion University that is bringing about this change. So I mentioned exploratory learning environments. I teach Introduction to Probability in uh, the university, and this is one of the questions that I like to give to my students. So we rolled two dice, and we kept track of how, many, uh, how often we obtained the sums 2 through 12. So for example, if one die came out 3, and the other die came out 4, then the sum is 7. And I asked the students, do you think 11 comes out more often than 12? Any ideas here, by the way? Well, to understand this question, one needs to understand abstract probability theory. So uh, one needs to understand joint random variables, one needs to understand the concept of equivalence classes, and to realize that there are two events that can give the sum 11, 5 and 6, and 6 and 5, while only one event that can give the sum 12, mainly 6 and 6. And because each of these events is equally likely, then we should expect 11 to come out more often than 12. But we pose this question to 8th graders, who know nothing about probability, and what they do is they're able to explore this empirically by using exploratory software. So here's a snapshot of how a student might be using the software, creating two dice using a model, then running the model and generating a thousand instances of two dice, subsequently separating these in instances into individual throws, and projecting this data on a histogram analyzing the histogram to realize that 11 comes out more often than 12. Well, so far so good, but how is this single teacher going to understand what an entire classroom of 40 students are doing with the software? The software outputs a log of hundreds and hundreds of actions, representing every mouse click and every menu item of the student. These are low-level events. How can a teacher make sense of these events? This is precisely what we're doing in my lab. We're developing artificial intelligence techniques that can infer how students are using the software to solve problems. So for example, this uh, visualization to the teacher provides information that the student had a failed attempt to solve the two dice problem, in which the student defined only one die, and subsequently was able to solve the problem by defining two dice and rolling the dice and analyzing the data. And I want to emphasize something, that no one told the computer about these two labels. The computer was able to automatically infer that the student had a failed attempt just by looking at past data. So imagine what a tool this is for a teacher. The teacher can come the next day to class, and we can generalize this concept to providing it with an automatic analysis of groups in the class. So for example, the software might tell the teacher, well, I found three general groups of students. I found students who were able to solve the problem on the first try. I found a group of stu students who were able to solve the problem only after a failed attempt. And I found a group of students who were not able to solve the problem at all. And the, the teacher can decide whether to drill in and zoom in to individual students in each group as deemed necessary. Now, how's that for a revolution, I ask you? Another example of ways in which we try to bring about the educational revolution is personalization. So everyone here relies on applications that adapt to our individual needs as users. Let me give you a quick example. I'm a Google buff, so when I go on Amazon, I'm going to get recommendations from Amazon that match my likeness for programming. And the way Amazon does it is it uses recommendation engines to look at other people that, like me, are Google buffs, and it looks to see what kind of books they, they liked and recommend me those books. 
But my friend, for example, who likes World War II novels, of course, is going to get widely different recommendation based on this recommendation algorithm because he has different concerns. So if we can adapt e-commerce to our individual needs, why can't we adapt education? Why should my introduction to probability course always get the same problem set? Why can't we tailor the problem set to the individual needs of each student? This is precisely what we are doing now. So let's take a target student, we'll call him John, and we want to rank questions in the order of difficulty we perceive John experiences. Now think what a powerful tool this is for John. So for example, John can see what kind of questions the system perceives to be hard, and then he has a clue about what he needs to study more. Or John can proceed to solve the questions incrementally, first solving easier questions and then moving on to harder questions. This is a great tool. So how do we bring this about? Well, we have a database of hundreds of thousands of students who solved questions in the past, and we match them to overlapping questions that John saw in the past. And we look for similarities. We look for students that experienced questions in a similar way to John, in the sense they found questions equally difficult to John. And we'll call those students similar. Now, what, how do I measure how a student perceive, how difficult a student perceives a question? Well, an obvious way is to look at the grade, right? Lower grades probably means more difficult questions to students. But there are other informative signals that we use. For example, the number of attempts a student tries to solve a problem until getting it right provides us with a clue. Also, the amount of time that the student is using to solve a question. So all of these informative signals combine to providing us with a way of ranking these questions for John without him solving them first. But it gives us an opportunity to estimate how difficult they will be. So I've given you two examples of how we can bring about a paradigm shift in education by combining the availability of data with algorithms for making sense of this data. And as in, in, in this way, we can adapt our learning environments to the individual needs of students and help them to realize their unique potential, which is what education is all about. So my dream and vision is to have the computer be a co true collaborator with the student, a friendly parrot, if you will, on the shoulder of the student, identifying exactly when is the right time to intervene and intelligently and gently nudge the student into the right direction. And this kind of work, my friends, will change the way our children learn forever. Thank you.